our next speaker, uh, he's been a freelancer, I think he's been for many, many years now, you, HP, beforehand. Um, HP, Burberry, Saudi. EDS. Um, recently in Saudi. Yeah, Coast in Saudi. Um, one of the things Richard says is he, he likes to be sort of put under pressure quite a lot. In my so, contracting career, basically, I dump the deep end and you either swim or you don't. So bear that in mind for the Q&A. Just really, <laughs> jump in some really ridiculously hard ones and watch you sweat. Um, so, but first of all, please welcome Richard to the page for talking about Zen and the art of people's work. Hello, everybody. Take a seat. Take a seat. So, Zen and the art of borrowing other people's work, eh? Okay? Well, I'm going to start with a disclaimer. There were no people or animals hurt during the events I'm going to describe. But I did have to put a few VMs down. So, I've got a serious point, but the talk itself is not serious. Feel free to laugh, throw fruit. Actually, I'd prefer if you didn't throw fruit, but you might do with one or two of these slots. So, who am I? Well, as I said, the name's Richard Purvis. It's spelled E-S. It's pronounced I-S. And everybody gets it wrong. I've heard the pervert joke so many times that uh, if I had a penny, I'd be a millionaire. You can find me on Slack and Jamf Nation as username Franklin. And I do have a Twitter account, um, which is called Nonsense Factory, um, for reasons I'll not get into here, but suffice to say, I have another business outside of IT. And it's spelled with a zero because somebody else has got the actual name. And you can find my own personal website at that address there, which is basically my name with a hyphen in it. And I occasionally blog about things that are kind of interesting. But, in the end, I'm just another admin. I'm just one of you guys. So, what am I faffing about today? So, how to borrow things. And, um, after we borrow things, I'm going to tell you a few stories of woe. That's not the reaction I was expecting. I was expecting to have to yell, shut up, that picture's awesome, but fair enough. But it's okay, because we'll get some stories of triumph, and you see, the cat's fine. See, you know, the, the RSPCA got there in time. And from stories of woe and some stories of triumph, lessons learned <laughs> all aboard the fail boat. Now, the thing is, I was going for cat pictures here all the way through, but I found that if you put Lessons Learned Kitty into Google Image Search, you get something else entirely. Do not Google Image Search. <laughs> oh yeah, we're going to have some wholly gratuitous plugs, and don't worry, this is the worst joke in the entire presentation. And we've got something special at the end. So, so let's start with the art of borrowing. Why in the name of all that's holy would you want to rip off other people? <laughs> well, to be fair, it comes in quite handy. And the first thing that happens is, you save time by not reinventing the wheel. Oh yeah, and those were actual Apple employees in Cupertino, and they did make a huge wheel out of iMac boxes. And uh, you can see the amount of duct tape they put on it to keep it together. Um, so, if someone else has already done the work for you, why do it again? Can we not just repurpose? So this means that... Eight weeks, sir. But you don't have eight weeks, so I'll do it for you in two. Sounds reasonable. Sounds fair enough. But more importantly, can you learn any new tricks from it? Improve your own skills. Can you help the wider community as a result? Because what you come up with might be perfect for somebody else. And it's all about paying it forward, basically. I, I hate that film. Ugh, I do apologise. So, how do we start? Well, Google. Gotta love Google. But the GitHub search also comes in very, very handy as well. GitHub search is not great for searching for certain things, but it is good for searching for projects. And since lots of people now are putting their stuff open source on GitHub, it's worth searching for projects and seeing what you come up with. Technical, technical blogs. Uh, I've got a big list of these. Charles Edge, who was on this morning, has probably the most complete list of technical blogs that are out there on his site, which is crypto.com. And I will provide links to all this stuff later. 
Twitter's always fun, but given the recent news about Twitter and everything that's going on, how long is Twitter going to last? Hence the reason I quite like that picture of the cat having eaten the bird. And of course, Slack. It used to be IRC, and when I first did these slides, IRC uh, was some of the channels was quite popular. Um, and then, about a couple of weeks after I finished the slides, Slack became more prevalent and IRC just withered and died. So, we're all on Slack. There's cards on the table. Please help yourself. Please come join us. So let's start with some uh, stories of woe. Yeah, this is an embarrassing one. So I was uh, tasked at one particular company. Uh, one of the tasks that they had was they wanted 5 volt 2 by a monkey. Uh, and they wanted everything to be as automated as possible, so I obliged. Oh, I attempted to oblige anyway. Um, so what you can do with the FD setup command is you can pass it an XML file full of stuff. Um, one of the things you can pass to it is a username and password. Uh, which is kind of handy if you're trying to, say, uh, put the local admin user automatically into File Vault and then put other people in afterwards. Um, one of the things you can do with Monkey is it's got a post install script, so when you set it to do things, you can then have it execute the script afterwards, which is where all this was happening. Just the slight problem is post install scripts are cached on each individual client and they are cached in plain text. And the folder's not locked down. So if you get one of these machines early enough and you're running this process, you've just got the local admin using the password. Gulp. So we stopped using it. And then I handed it to my replacement because I then went to Saudi Arabia for the following week. Um, so yeah, I was under timescales and I completely screwed up. So um, I got the idea for a lot of this stuff from Rich Trauber's blog. Because Rich is pretty much the Far Vault 2 man. Um, so this is both a case of how to borrow work that other people have done, purpose it for your use, and then completely screw up the implementation, which is exactly what I did. Anyone here use Netsus? Anyone here had problems with Netsus? You are shaking your hand. What, what sort of things happened? Um, <clears throat> I think the thing's caching, but I don't want it to, and I haven't got it to stop caching. Okay, okay. I had problems with Netsus, and bearing in mind this was the previous version of Netsus, this was Netsus 3, Netsus 4 has just come out. And at the place where I was working at, they had a bunch of eight year old X servers uh, running Windows, you know, running Windows Server? Huh? Um, <laughs> they were running uh, Apple Server on 10.5. And that's how they had Netboot. And one of the things we wanted to investigate was, can we get rid of the Apple hardware? Because we can't get spare parts for it and it's all dying. Um, so we implemented the RAN, a proof of concept. Because at the time I was doing this, uh, BSD Pi didn't exist. So Netsus was basically it. And I did find some weird and wonderful, very old websites about how to get Netboot running on Unix, the data from 2002 for a version of Unix that probably didn't exist anymore. So we implemented and put it in, and put it in with an IP help on a single user subnet, and then watched as imaging broke across the entire university. And we had no idea why. And we ended up pulling the plug on Nexus, and I came away very, very unimpressed with Nexus. Um, and it was only later on, because uh, Duncan McCracken, who uh, run, runs a company called Mondata down in Australia, uh, he did a talk at Mac Admin 2014 on, on Netboot, where he literally pulled apart the entire Netboot. And the thing was, he was pulling apart work that somebody else had done, and if you watch the video, and it is available on Max's Admin uh, website, um, he does say that he ended up with as much hair as me. Uh, and uh, he invented a few new swear words. Um, my recommendation is to use either server app or BSD Pi. And uh, Papine, who wrote BSD Pi, is obviously with us, so you can grab him and pick his brains. Um, but like I say, it's only later when I found out why. So, Netboot, Net, the Netboot service has an image in priority. Uh, and on server app, that priority adjusts itself depending on server load. 
and if you set up a uh, netbook image with a high enough index number, it will then do automatic load balancing. The problem with Nexus is it's hardwired to maximum. And down here, where you've got the submit mask and stuff, it's kind of cut off on this, unfortunately. Um, for Nexus, to make Nexus work, you have to put in, obviously, subnet and net mask of where it's going to be listening to. So if you populate this stuff, and even if you don't have an IP helper, it actually still causes problems. And like I say, the more people put stuff in that, and I couldn't do the correlation at the time, uh, the more imaging went off. So. so this is actually a screen grab from Duncan McCracken's talk at Maxis Adam 2014. And this is where he starts pulling apart the DHCPD conf that makes Nexus work. And these two bits here, it says FFFF, are permanently hardwired to the maximum priority available. So Nexus basically doesn't cooperate with anything. And it doesn't cooperate very nicely at all. Real shame. But we get some good triumph stories next. Um... Automating Mac server app builds. So again, same place, decided not to use Nexus, gonna put in Mac minis instead. And realized that the server build process that I had um, used to take four to six hours to complete per server. <laughs> and I realized that a lot of this stuff is actually kind of automatable. And it was so automatable that I put it all in GitHub. The problem is, is that we I tied the, all of this into Casper, and the server app that I was using was version 4. The server app does not function until you've hit the license accept. And the license accept can only be done by GUI prior to 503. But Rich Charlton and Charles Edge apparently had a word with some Apple engineers at WWDC 2015. And as a result, they got a command line based license acceptance. Ah, that's exactly what I'm looking for. And then went, damn it, he's beat me to it again. So, if you can't beat him, borrow him. He posts up the code. And as a result, if you have a look on my GitHub and you find that script, Rich and Charles get full credit for solving that issue. And I put in the note to say that they did it and a link to their blog of where all that information came from. And it was one less thing on my feature list. Unfortunately, I don't have access to Casper anymore, so development's kind of stalled, but either way. So, on the basis of a fairly major issue that I had, because it meant you had to have a separate monolithic image to do it, what that means is, success! I spent a lot of time on Google Image Search, can't you tell? Um, my favourite one's next, though, which was... Um, it's been mentioned this morning, Lachlan Stewart's Patchu project. For anyone who's using Casper, uh, Patchu is a kind of a way to give monkey type functionality on Casper. Um, and it's probably the most complicated bash script you'll ever see. But it does the job, and it does the job very well. So, as Ben here mentioned this morning, uh, Lachlan fought um, Coco Dialog so it could uh, run over the login window and log out. Uh, because up till this point, um, Patchu was using some, what I consider, pretty nasty Apple script embedded into Bash in order to make dialogue appear at certain times. And then he was using Coco Dialog for the rest of it when it was uh, appearing over the GUI. Um, Patchu was also using the old way through the Casper API of identifying a machine by MAC address. Um, now, as I'm sure you can appreciate with laptops like this, they don't have built-in Ethernet ports anymore. They've got removable dongles. So anyone who's ever dealt with Casper and removable dongles knows what a pain that was until Casper 9 when Jam started using the UUID as the identifier. <coughs> so I go through and I use his and I fix it. And I had a little spare time at the time. And I posted to GitHub and I sent him a nice message. Lachlan is a wonderful Australian, and Australians are quite a forthright people. I do admire them for that. But I love the message he sent me on Slack. 
How have I written this without access to a JSS? <laughs> so, you know, sometimes when you contribute back, you get some nice messages. I thought that was pretty funny at the time. So when we get to lessons learned from all of this, the first thing I learned is, I ran out of Zen and Cat pictures at this point. <laughs> but more importantly, um, running things like Netsus and running projects blindly in place and expecting it to work first time is a guaranteed recipe for fail. And I failed in some fairly major ways. Like I say, depriving a university of imaging until we turn the server off was pretty bad. But you don't learn unless you try. There's a lot of people out there who will try something and go, oh, it doesn't work. Nobody does the investigation work. The, the whole netboot thing drove me mad for months. And then I saw Duncan McCracken's talk and went, that fits. <clears throat> so it's always worth showing your investigation work before asking for help. Um, I have a terrible reputation with um, Apple Store Genius bars because uh, I had a broken phone, went up to them and said, what have you done? And I'd give them a long list of stuff and the guy would sigh and just go, I'll just give you another one. The British Army 6Ps, anyone heard of that? Um, sorry, I'm going to swear here. Proper planning prevents piss poor performance. So plan it all out first, don't leap in blind. Again, I've done that, learn from me, please. Um, and knowing how to take it all back, how to revert everything when it all goes horribly wrong is a major plus. Um, I've been part of too many IT projects where they didn't have a reversion plan and they needed it. And sure enough, that's the point where the user, the user stopped phoning up in droves. And the last thing that anyone wants is angry people yelling at them down the phone. I spent too many times in call centers doing it and dealing with that. But, collect and give the appropriate feedback where possible. Well, this is a good one. This is things like, um, again, you've heard of projects like Auto Casper MBI and stuff like that. Um, I helped test the first few versions. Um, and it was all about giving the appropriate feedback so that the product could mature. And you know, you might find a project, a product out there that does almost but not quite what you need. <coughs> Um, being able to give that constructive feedback pays dividends. Be prepared to be ignored if uh, people just go, oh, that's rubbish, because it's not very helpful. But sharing what you find within the community is also good, because somebody out there on Slack or wherever might be able to point you in a, a better direction, might be able to give you an insight into things that you haven't truly considered. And if you can, avoid non-disclosure agreements in your employment contracts. Um, there's too many people out there who are probably coming up with good stuff and they can't share it because... And this is literally <coughs> true of when I was in Saudi Arabia for that university. Everything I did for that university is their property. And it was in my, in my employment contract and it was non-negotiable. Non so everything I did for them, I can't share which doesn't help anyone because some of the things that I worked on, like uh, Druva InSync was um, you know, particularly nasty and could really help people out. Can't, can't do it, can't share it. And plus the fact, good karma is always a plus when you get to share things around with people. I mean, uh, sorry Ben, I'm gonna pick on you. Auto Casper and BI, I know that came out of your CCE uh, and I know it was you know, something that you started, but it's helped a lot of people. How does that make you feel? Right. Maybe I was invested in really working. Yeah, exactly. So on the basis of that, let's have some uh, holy gratuitous plugs. So basic people I always link to. Uh, Rich Troughton learned an awful lot from that man. Uh, ben Matthew and Tom's. Uh, Greg, who's giving the uh, opposing presentation in the other room right now. Um, yeah, in the early days when I was trying to learn about MCX and stuff like that, he's got a lot of stuff on there uh, from the early days that's still potentially quite relevant. Um, he does postmodern stuff as well, and also he's the guy behind Monkey. Uh, Charles Edge, who you saw this morning. 
The second cryptid link is the Mac admin links. He's got, probably got the most comprehensive list of uh, links to Mac admin blogs and stuff like that that, of that I've seen from anyone. And it's well worth going through. And I know I managed to get on there, and I'm not entirely sure how. <sighs> Jamf Nation. Um, Jamf Nation, even if you're not a Jamf customer, is still a good place to search because people are posting scripts on there and they don't necessarily be Jamf specific. So if you're using open source tools, it's possible to find things on there that you can use. And it's always good to say thank you. We even occasionally get Windows questions on there. <laughs> We can't help, but you know, we do, we do get them. And of course, Slack, and that's the link to uh, sign up to sign up to the Mac admin. <coughs> uh, Three thousand three hundred people and climbing as of this morning. All the cards say thirty-two hundred, and it's just getting better. And of course, I've got to put myself at the bottom. But there is one more thing, and borrowing only makes sense if you let people lend what you've done in the first place. And in the spirit of borrowing, so therefore I am lending out. And I was working on this over Christmas and I thought this would be the perfect place to announce this. Uh, so for you Jav customers, JSS in the box. You might have heard of Monkey in the Box, well this is my Casper equivalent. Um, Oh, by the way, before I proceed, I understand Kitty had a project called JSS Manager, and it kind of does similar things, and I'm really, really sorry, Kitty. Uh, I didn't mean to duplicate, but there we go. So it's a one-stop Ubuntu-based setup script for Jams JSS. Um, it will install all the server software that you need. It will install Java. It will install the Java cryptographic extensions. It will put on all the other stuff that you'll need, like unzip and wherever. You copy the script and a single root.war file that you get when you buy Jamf's JSS. You copy it to the server and you run it and it does the rest. Inside the script itself, you can configure it to use either an internal MySQL database. So if you want everything on one box, you can. If you have a separate MySQL box somewhere that you want to use, you can put the username and passwords in at this point and it will use them. And it will point everything to them. And it will even do the access grants and writes. Uh, database backup and restoration. So yes, you can dump databases and you can put them back. <coughs> and you can have as many JSS instances as you want. You can have a single context instance with this. Uh, you could have as many multiple context instances as you want with this, as many as your server can handle. Um, I've got JSS upgrading on there, so you can copy a new root.war file, hit the upgrade button, tell it which instance to upgrade and give it a test. And then if you're happy and you've got multiple instances, you can tell them to do them all. And it will, do, and it will, it will warn you, it will stop everything, it will upgrade a lot and then start it all back up again, and then it's ready for further testing. Uh, the bit I'm most proud of is the server hardening. Uh, by default, the options are set to off, so you just get a bog standard JSS running on port 8080 with HTTP. You can set it so that it will grab a certificate from Let's Encrypt. It will point everything on port 443, and I'll have to do some um, off-bind hacking on Ubuntu to get that to work. Um, so you end up with an SSL certificate signed JSS, and it's all secure comms at that point in time. Um, what I haven't put on here is Let's Encrypt certificates only last 90 days, so there's a 60 day renewal on it. And that's automatic and in the background, and you can also do it manually if you wish, if uh, Let's Encrypt gets compromised, and Let's Encrypt has already been used for one piece of malware out there. So, they have a short expiry time on their certificates. Uh, the other thing about Let's Encrypt is it only does uh, domain vetted certificates. That's like the bottom level of vetting for SSL certs. Um, if you want the nice big green bar, you've got to pay for those. But it will harden everything. It will even do the server firewall for you. Um, at the minute, it's Ubuntu only. Uh, I will do... Uh, a Red Hat slash CentOS one at some point in the future, but there's enough differences between those Unix that that is not a small task. 
More importantly, it's available today. And I'm giving it away. And no cheating on your CGA with it, because I've already tipped off the, uh, the, the Jamf tuners that I don't like, Rob Pop, Jamf Custom. But that may change. Um, so now that I've announced that, I'd just like to say... Well, they say all good things come to an end. What's that got to do with this show? <laughs> Oh, uh, we had to end with that one, didn't we? Um, you know how I was saying before the plug was the worst joke in this? No, no, this is the worst joke because I couldn't find any Zen Master pictures, so I ended up with a Jedi Master, and it's the same thing, right? <laughs>